Okay, welcome everyone to today's uh, colloquium. We're very happy to have uh, Monica Guica uh, give a talk, and she will talk about uh, deformed CFDs. Um, so please uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much for, for the, the invitation to speak. Um, yeah, so, so I'll be discussing some, uh, some two-dimensional theories, um, which, which turn out to have some, some interesting properties, uh, as you see, and that were in, uh, um, they were sort of in the center of attention or, or some center of attention over the past uh, five years or so. And these are the so-called irrelevant current current different CFTs, sorry, it's, it's a bit of a heavy name, or um, as known as Smirnov zomological uh, deformations. And what, uh, so, so in this talk, I'll review them, and I'll also try to convince you that um, um, a good way to, to, to think about these theories is as some sort of non-local two-dimensional CFTs. So, so this is what the title is about. And even so this will be uh, pretty much a field theory talk. So hopefully only very basic field theory CFT uh, is going to be needed. Um, a lot of the um, intuition and motivation for, uh, for this work was, uh, was uh, from um, thinking from the perspective of holography. So I'll try to, to motivate that. Okay, so, so let me just uh, start slowly. So uh, by reminding you what, uh, what conformal field theories are. So, so these are QFTs that are invariant under conformal transformations. So you have translations, rotations, importantly scaling, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, these theories have a wide range of applications to, to, to various physical situations. They describe uh, <coughs> continuous phase transitions uh, because they are fixed points of uh, the uh, randomization loop flows. They, they might provide the, uh, you know, um, an ultraviolet completion to quantum field theories, or they might describe the IR behavior of, of QFTs. Uh, they're also ubiquitous in, in string theory, so, 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 so they're very nice. And another thing that's very nice about them is that they have an axiomatic and in principle non-perturbative definition in terms of the properties of certain local primary, so-called primary operators. So, uh, so basically, these uh, this, this operators, uh, their two and three point functions are completely fixed uh, by conformal symmetries in terms of uh, some numbers, which are the operator dimensions, delta i and three point function coefficients, C, I, J, K. And all the uh, other higher point functions are actually determined from this via the op operator product expansion. And then, uh, um, by looking at, uh, for example, different ways of writing the four-point function, one can get some infinite set of constraints on the CFT data over here called the bootstrap constraints. Okay, but, but, uh, but what's nice about them is, is this axiomatic uh, definition. Uh, uh, so. Uh, okay, so this is true for uh, CFTs in any dimensions. In two dimensions, you get some extra bonuses from the fact that the conformal group is actually infinite dimensional. Uh, so the, the symmetry algebra consists of two copies of the Virasora algebra, and then you have even more constraints uh, from the symmetries. Uh, now, uh, okay, so among the very nice applications of CFTs is that they appear in the so-called ADS CFT correspondence. So, so they, they, they can be used to define quantum gravity in ADS. So, so the statement of the correspondence is that any theory of quantum gravity on anti de Sitter space-time, so that's hyperbolic space-time in, in d plus one dimensions, is equivalent to a conformal field theory in, in one dimension less. And uh, there are basically maybe two ways to, to think about this correspondence. One uh, is the way that um, it was originally derived from, from string theory, uh, where you basically take some, some some particular objects in string theory, some d-brains and so on. And uh, okay, so, so in one description, okay, they, they, they look like brains and in the low energy limit, one, one finds some particular conformal field theory. Uh, but then this, these objects have a dual description in terms of, of some gravity background with a long throat, which deep down is, is anti de Sitter. And in the low energy decoupling limit, you, you find some particular uh, gravity theory on these ideas. So this is how you derive particular instances of the correspondence using string theory. Um, 
However, uh, later it was realized that uh, that uh, one can formulate this correspondence in in uh, completely universal terms. So any CFT which has a you know large number of degrees of freedom and eventually a large gap in in operator dimensions uh, describes some theory of gravity in uh, one higher dimension ADS, and then uh, one. <coughs> Uh, so, so the the various uh, sort of um, let's say axiomatic, or the, the the various inherent properties of the CFTs are always mirrored on the gravity side. So the CFT symmetries translate into so-called asymptotic symmetries in uh, on the gravity side. So, so, so these are um, basically implemented by diffeomorphisms that act non-trivially on on the boundary of ADS. And there's an infinite number of them in, in three dimensions. Um, then the CFT correlation functions map to scattering amplitudes. Um, the, the bootstrap constraints in this one over n expansion uh, map, map to you know, approximate bulk locality and so on. So, so, so there are these two top down and bottom up approaches, which are complementary and very nice for understanding quantum gravity in ADS. Uh, OK. Uh, this talk, uh, I, I, I won't talk uh, actually about CFTs. I'll talk about some 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 other sort of theories, uh, which are non-local, a set of non-local UV complete QFTs, uh, whose, whose structure is is uh, is a little bit unusual. So uh, so you may be used with the idea that uh, you you have uh, you know you're trying to define some QFT. So you start with some conformal field theory in the ultraviolet, and then you add some relevant operator and then you flow. That's that's a standard way to, to derive uh, to define QFTs. Uh, these theories are defined in sort of the opposite way. One starts with a conformal field theory in the IR, and then adds to it an irrelevant deformation. And uh, on my worry, this is uh, maybe a bit uh, ill-defined uh, because you know when you add an irrelevant deformation at each order, you have to specify some new coefficients, and you soon lose track of that. So, so that's one problem. Uh, the other problem is that even if you uh, are able to define this deformation in some way, in in most cases the theory is so defined is going to stop making sense above some energy scale. So the theory will have a cutoff. Um, the theories that I will discuss are extremely nice in that, first of all, there's a way to specify the deformation at each point along the flow such that uh, you know, it's, it, it defines the theory. So there's some way of specifying the deformation uh, unambiguously. Uh, and second of all, if one takes any theory along this line of theories and goes to arbitrarily high energy, uh, there's nothing particularly bad that happens. So, so the theory is UV complete uh, by itself. Oh, that's because, sorry, the main mental, I thought the main idea was that you are actually going against the renormalization group flow. We are going other direction. So what is- I, I don't think this is an RG. I don't think this is an RG. But that operator actually is how renormalization group flow approaches a new fixed point. That operator is the same one I thought, no? So this is no. I think uh, in, in in RG you're you're integrating uh, out degrees of freedom, right? Right. In in these flows, uh, th these are integrable flows where where you're not integrating in or out anything, as far as I understand. Right, but if I would have a flow which re usual that's stage, true. I that's have true. a flow which gets to this point, so I'm coming from one UV theory to ER theory. I can always ask the question that if I am in the second fixed point down there and sitting there, I can always ask the question, what was the main operator that brought me there to looking kind of up in the yeah. flow? And, and in certain non-flows, so that operator is TT bar. Right, so I thought Indeed. that was the idea. So TT bar is that operator when you look up and this is Romajo, and that's how you got there. And JT but, bar but also. But but here you really want to go a finite distance along the flow. So so if you're looking at a, at a standard flow between the two uh, two CFTs, where uh, you know as you expand uh, around the IR, the first operator is the bar that happens. But the way that you continue up is going to be different from the way that I'm continuing up here. Oh, so this is not the same philosophy I just described. This is a concrete answer. Not at all, because okay. uh, in in the example you're describing, you're flowing from UV CFT to IR CFT. Whereas here I'm flowing from 
and by flow, I, re I really don't mean RG flow. I just mean I'm, I'm having some sort of uh, one parameter uh, walk uh, in the space of theories. So, so I'm flowing between an IRCFT and a theory that's uh, intrinsically non-local in the unit. Okay. Yeah. Th thanks for the precision. So, so yeah. So, so, so this is why I'm saying that these are these are really not very standard flows that, that one consider. And so, so this is a hugely finely tuned irrelevant flow. Uh, okay. So, so yeah. So, so, so what one does in this theory? So, so what finds some, some theory that UV complete by itself without being a CFD. It's, it's intrinsically non-local and the non-locality scale is basically set by the coefficient, the dimension for coefficient of the irrelevant deformation. Uh, why is uh, <clears throat> one interested uh, in such theories? Well, it's uh, some sort of non-standard UV behavior in CFD. It's interesting to study. Uh, this sort of theories also have interesting applications to, for example, QCD flux tubes in, in the case of uh, TT bar. Uh, but uh, my personal reason for being interested in them is because they also seem to be relevant to holography beyond ADS. And as I'll try to, to motivate this, uh, this, this connection to holography, uh, motivate some sort of new perspective and some new properties of, of, of these theories. So, so now let me explain the, the, the connection. Uh, so the connection is, is as follows. So, so I explained how one may get ADS by looking at the, you know, the near horizon limit of some uh, <clears throat> background created by some T-brains. Uh, but there exists quite a number of um, examples in string theory. So I'm talking about top-down constructions when one has some sort of additional intermediate decoupling limit. So, so you might have some, some geometry that interpolates between some decoupled non-ADS background over here to some ADS in the IR. And uh, if you're trying to translate this vaguely into CFT terms, well, what this translates to, well, the CF ADS is some sort of CFT in the IR. And then there's some non-normalizable deformation that produces that background. So that's some irrelevant deformation. And the fact that you have a decoupling limit over here suggests that whatever theory you're, you're getting is going to be sort of UV complete by itself. So, so this suggests that you really have this sort of irrelevant flow like this, where it, it's hugely finely tuned so as to produce a, a UV complete. And, uh, and uh, you know, in the UV, uh, this, uh, this thing is not going to be a CFT because the background over here is not ADS. But, uh, but this could be a way to try to understand uh, non-ADS holography. Um, and sort of the existence of such backgrounds, classes of such backgrounds in, in string theory, some sort of you know, moral existence proof of, of, of maybe theories defined this way. But, uh, but in practice, uh, well, this is very, very hard to study. So, so there are a couple of examples where, you know, um, a couple of examples that are, that are understood, but they have super special structure with involving star products and so on. And generally, even with supersymmetry, you, you can't really track this. Uh, now, uh, there's some uh, ray of hope if you're in two boundary dimensions. So it's the same drawing as before, but now it's CFT2 and here I'm starting from ADS3. Uh, because in that case, uh, so I mean, you, you again have some various string backgrounds that interpolate between some non ADS and ADS over here. These string backgrounds ge generically have to do with the near horizons of uh, extremal black holes in string theory. And uh, for these backgrounds, I mean, you, you can play this game of, uh, okay, let's just use the general tools of holography to try to infer some properties of this dual field theory, this non-local theory from holography. So one computation you can do, you can compute the asymptotic symmetries. And oftentimes you get two copies of your referral. Uh, you can also compute scattering. And then that predicts that uh, the field theory two-point function looks like a CFT two-point function, but where the dimensions are not numbers, Rather, they're functions of the moment, some fixed function of the moment. And that's, uh, that's sort of uh, very curious because it suggests that, uh, um, at least in this, uh, for this two dimensional theory, that it suggests that there might be some sort of general structure that, that's underlying this. Uh, this okay, sort sorry, of... one question. Can I interrupt? Just excuse me. Yeah. Because it's very interesting. Actually, you are saying normally we would say that in ADS3 situation, Mm -hmm. we, did, we do have already some one parameter family of CFTs that we can play, which is holographic. And this is known, right? In, in one ADS parameter. 
Well, one parameter is that you can have Navio Schwartz or Ramon Ramon background. They are still all conformal. So yeah, yeah. So, so you're talking about the conformal manifold. Yeah, I'm going right, right. off the conformal manifold now. So now what you are saying, sorry. Now what you are saying is that there is another one parameter uh, holographic uh, relation, but now this is not like we are turning on some fields and turning off, like as I said, B field or Navio Schwartz Ramon. But this one parameter thing is. Uh, uh, taking you to non-local situation. Exactly, and you can actually parameterize these guys. So, so, so these are parameterized by the, for, for example, in the case of these backgrounds, they're parameterized by the 1,2 single trace operators in, in the, say, D1, D5 CFT. And I think you have uh, maybe uh, order 21 of those. So, so, so you're, you're turning on various mixed fluxes. And, and I mean, you, you know how many of them there are. So I, recently, I don't it was claimed by Gabriel oh claimed by people, let's say I heard from Matthias, I'm not sure, I'm not expert, that they actually did now have a precise statement what is a C, what exactly is the CFT, which is dual to ADS3, remember? They had this- ADS3, yeah. Right, so long ago, like Jan de Boer and others had conjectures that this is moduli space of instant on some T4 or symmetric product of T4. Now there is a precise state. So in that language, do you know what this operate, how to write that operator, and what is the one parameter no local family? Uh, I mean, it's almost accepted. There, there are, uh, so I I, I'll talk about this at the end. I mean, and, uh, because most of my talk is not going to be about such backgrounds, because TT bar, double trace TT bar and GT bar are not dual to non ADS holography. But, um, uh, but uh, th there are, um, for example, the deformations, a single trace TT bar which is defined in the symmetric product or before. So, so that could be applied to, to the construction by Gabriel Diel and et al. But they have a very special one. It's not symmetric product or before. They have a they have very specified way to think right, about it. Right, right. So, so, so it, it might have to do with some sort of... Uh, of um, taking that ADS3 into some sort of stringy analog. I, I don't really know what I'm talking about. It, it might have to do to the string analog of an asymptotically linear dilaton background. Okay, thanks. It would be interesting because this is first time that we are convinced that we know what is this CFT. Yeah, so so that that full background may be amenable to 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 precise worksheet computations, as as was the ADS three one. I I don't know because I'm not a specialist, but it could be. And and then it might be dual to this uh, single trace TT bar, which okay. you could also define in the symmetric product or default on the boundary. Yeah. Okay, but but, but this is sort of a generic motivating discussion. I, I don't have any 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 particular theory in mind. And here I'm just saying that uh, some irrelevant flows, and there will not be the irrelevant flows that I'll talk about in this talk, actually. <laughs> But some irrelevant flows are dual to such backgrounds. And such backgrounds, when you sort of like play with the tools of holography, you find symmetries that you don't expect there, them to be there in a non-local theory, like these Eurasaurus and, and scattering with momentum dependent conformal dimensions. So this suggests that, that maybe such theories defined via such irrelevant, hugely finely tuned irrelevant flows such that they're UV complete. Maybe there's some sort of non-local CFTs in, in, in the sense of having this property. So, so, so this was sort of the motivation for, for, for this work to, to try to understand whether one can make sense of, of this notion of non-local CFT. So, so what do I mean by non-local CFT? It's a UV complete non-local two-dimensional CFT, which has virasolo times virasolo symmetry. That's, that's the definition. And you can ask whether they exist. You might say, uh, didn't I just show to you that they exist? No, I didn't because these gravity calculations, they're completely out of control. I mean, they give you some hints, but uh, you never know whether you're doing things correctly. So, so we want a field theory proof that they exist. And of course the answer could be no, case in which we stop discussing, or it could be yes. Um, case in which uh, there are like a zillion other interesting questions that, that one can ask. So how do you reconcile the Virasoro with the non-locality? Uh, you know, can you define some sort of primary operators whose correlation functions are fixed? How do they look, etc.? cetera? Uh, is there some axiomatic definition of this theory such that you don't have to refer to the flow, but you can just define them somewhere? Uh, can you classify all the possible um, deformations and flows and, you know, conformal manifolds thereof and so on? 
and, and what are the implications. So, so there, if, if these things exist, uh, there's, I think there are a lot of things to, to, to explore in, in, in this direction that are interesting. So, so, so the claim, the claim is that this TT budget and JT bar deform CFTs, which I haven't introduced yet, but, but will in a second, are precisely uh, non-local CFTs. And uh, so, as I said, the, the, the most non-trivial thing to establish is that they're UV complete non-local to the that's, 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 that's the most non-trivial thing uh, about these theories. Um, but actually, that, that piece of the work was done for us by Smirnov and Samologico. Uh, so basically what I'll show is that they, they actually have an infinite number of symmetries, which organize themselves into two copies of Virasoro for TT bar or Virasoro Katsmundi for, for JT bar. And uh, if you want to have some classical intuition in what, uh, what implements these symmetries, there's some sort of field dependent coordinate transformations, which we also call pseudo conforming transformations. Uh, then, uh, the last claim is that at least in JT bar deformed CFTs, which uh, are better understood just because they're simpler, I, I think the same should call for TT bar. There is some sort of notion of a primary operator, and uh, its correlation functions are entirely fixed in, the, in terms of those of the undeformed CFT. And in particular, when you look at two and three point functions, they look exactly like momentum space CFT two point functions but where the dimensions are replaced by momentum dependent, specific momentum dependent component equations. Okay, so, so these are the claims. Uh, maybe I should stop for questions if, if, if there are any. Okay, good. So if it's clear what I'm planning to do, okay, let me, uh, uh, okay, so, so, so this is what I'm planning to do. So, so I'll start with a review of this TT bar and JT bar different CFTs. Then I'll give you a general quantum mechanical proof of the Virasoro symmetry. And I'll discuss the relation between Virasoro and these pseudo conformal transformations. I'll, I'll talk about the proposal for primary operators and finally conclude uh, with some implications for non endless So Okay. <clears throat> so, so let me first tell you what, uh, what these deformations are. So they're precisely irrelevant deformations of two-dimensional CFTs, which are constructed from bilinears of two usually higher spin conserved currents, which I'll denote as J, A, and J, B. So they're just two different currents. And um, to construct them, one first defines the so-called spin of the of operator, or J, J, B, which is defined from the coincidence limit of this particular anti-symmetric combination of the two current components. Okay, so 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 basically, uh, what these people showed is that when you uh, take this coincidence limit, you 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 you're gonna have a, a double trace operator, this O J J B, and all the rest are pure derivative terms, which will drop out when you integrate the operator. So so this is how it's defined. It's a good definition, and then. Uh, Plus this operator has some very nice factorization properties. Uh, and then the smirnov samolsko deformation is simply you add this operator to the action in the following way. So, so to, to the original PFT, you, well, you just construct it like this and you add it. And then in the deformed theory, you recompute the currents. They, they will in general be mu dependent. Recompute the operator and then deform by the new operator and so on. Okay, so, so that's the definition. At each step, you use the operator constructing from that theory. Um, and uh, and uh, this is supposed to be a, a well-defined uh, irrelevant flow that's, that's completely well-specified. Uh, so, so in principle, one can do this with, uh, with uh, any conserved currents. There are a couple of deformations that were particularly um, uh, much studied in, in, in the literature because they're universal. So one is the TT bar uh, deformation where one takes the, the two currents to co correspond to different components of the stress tensor, uh, properly antisymmetrized so as to get something that's um, you know, Lorentz invariant. That's one thing. Uh, JT bar, one takes one current to be a U1 current and the other current to be the generator of translations in the Z bar direction on the plane, so the so-called T bar. And uh, this deformation uh, breaks the Lorentz invariance and, uh, okay, um, 
Okay, this is what it is. The, the reason that I, I discussed JT bar as opposed to JTA, where you know th this is formed by a U1 current and the components of the stress sensor in some arbitrary direction XA, is that this guy will turn out to have some some particular noise. When, when Monica, did anyone did anyone ask question if this uh, uh, trajectory has a potential, like in the logic of theorem, when you do other way, regular way? In normalization group, as you know, Sasha proved that uh, uh, normalization group flow comes with a, a gradient function. So the flow is gradient and there is a potential. Anyone ask about this, if there is such thing like a gradient function and potential for such mu? Mm, not that I know. Mm. Not that I know. One could suspect that this also has a gradient flow. Um... Yeah, not that I know. So, can I ask an elementary question? Yes, please. Um, why, in when the uh, deformations are irrelevant, is the flow out of the fixed point? I would have expected it to be into the fixed point for irrelevant deformations. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I'm going to the UV, and 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 the irrelevant oh, yeah. okay. deformations grow into the, in the UV. UV. Okay, Sorry. usually people. Okay. Uh, Consider flowing to the IR. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's another weird thing because usually in holography, high energy physics, we, we care a lot about the UV. Danger, it's just higher dimensional operator in two, two dimensions. Yeah, no, I, I think she answered my question, uh, Samson. I, I just joined the talk, so I'm catching up. Oh, sorry, <laughs> thanks. Uh, it's very good because I just started to do the review, so you didn't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, very good. So um, yeah, so 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 these are the the uh, two two such universal deformations. And the nice thing about them is that they're highly tractable. So one can compute a lot of exact things in the, in this deform theory: the exact finite side spectrum, the S matrix. They preserve integrability if initially present. So so they're really nice deformations. And uh, the deform theory. So it becomes non-local at the scale set by, by the deformation, but has been argued to be UV complete. The argument has to do with the behavior of the F matrix in the UV. OK, so let me just uh, tell you some sample results in, in this DT bar deformation. So, so if you write that uh, the deformation in components for when it's the stress tensor deforming, this is what it looks like. Hence, hence the name. Here, mu is the TD bar coupling, which has dimensions of length squared because it's an irrelevant operator. And just to see what it does. So, if, for example, your original undeformed theory are, uh, you know, N free bosons and your TT bar deform them, what you're going to get, at least the classical level, is the Nambu-Goto action for a string in N plus two dimensional target space in static gauge. Static gauge means you you align the TT bar time and space with the target space time and one of the spatial dimensions. And uh, okay, so for n equals 24, that's the bosonic string. For n equal to one, this is okay, it was simple enough to write, uh, to write it down. So, so you see um, this, this um, you know, perturbative definition in terms of mu really produces an infinite number of, of, of derivatives, infinite powers of derivatives. So, so the theory is non local. Um, this this connection to the Nambu Goto action uh, shows a very nice uh, illustrates a nice property of of this deformation, uh, because you, you can really think of the TT bar deformation as a change of gauge in the Nambu Goto action. So you see the original free bosons are Nambu Goto in conformal gauge. I have told you that the TT bar deformed one is Nambu Goto in static gauge. So so you're really just changing gauge. And basically, this implies that the deformed and non-deformed theories are just related by a field-dependent coordinate transformation, which I've written over here. These are the TT bar coordinates, and these are the CFT ones. So it depends on the integral of the stress tensor. These are sometimes called dynamical coordinates. And uh, OK, and this, uh, this, this thing that uh, you're basically seeing the original CFT through these uh, dynamical coordinates has, has led to some nice non-perturbative definition of the TT bar deformation in terms of coupling uh, the original um, QFT to, to, to some topological theory. Well, yeah, it is a very tricky thing, actually, because number got to action is not CFT. Number got to action is a string server. You're integrating your metrics. What I mean, metric is dynamical, two-dimensional metric. So number got to action is a coupled system 
of CFT and so, so yeah, so just classically, the, 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 the statement is that if you're gauge fixing it in some particular way, you get a CFT. If you're gauge fixing it in a different way, you, you get a TT bar. So what is basically says that the, um, if you have a, a CFT coupled to two-dimensional gravity, which is a number of situation, then uh, in this space, in the, that, 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 that theory is the same cell. So the two theories are sitting in the same class of gravity coupled, two-dimensional gravity coupled to two-dimensional CFT, which means that from string theory point of view, if Nambugoto is a string theory, it's the same string theory. Right, except that um, I, I, I think, uh, uh, except that you have to be careful about boundary conditions. Oh yeah, boundary conditions, yes. So, so, so basically, you yeah, you, you're, you're right that uh, at the, from a bulk perspective, they're pretty much the same theory, but the, I think the whole non-triviality comes from the boundary conditions. Boundary and conditions on worksheet or in space-time? Uh, on, on the worksheet. Oh, well, oftentimes you, you want to compactify the worksheet. So, 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 so for example, uh, to, to derive this S matrix, this S matrix basically comes from this non-trivial, uh, you know, field dependent corner transformation between the two descriptions, which acts non trivially on the asymptotic states. So, so the two theories are indeed very simply related, but they're not the same theory. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, good. So, uh, okay, so, so, so this is what the deformed S matrix looks like. And this is pretty much a gravitational S matrix. So, so for example, just to see it better from two to two scattering, this is e to the i mu times the, you know, Mandelstam S, it's proportional to the energy squared. Um, and, uh, okay, you can do a, you, you can also show that this S matrix implies that there's a minimum length in the theory set by mu. Uh, and also this S matrix can be related this deformation, universal deformation of the S matrix can be related to a universal deformation of the spectrum via the thermodynamic phase balance. Uh, then there's this question that uh, basically touches on what uh, Samson was saying before, does TT bar uh, yield the theory of 2D quantum gravity related to this sort of Walsh description in connection to Nambugoto? Um, so, so initially it was argued uh, by these people that the answer is yes. Um, however, uh, I, I should say that uh, it's a bit unclear what you mean by a theory of quantum gravity in two dimensions because you don't have a propagating graviton. So to me, uh, you know, you, you can also like, you, you might say, okay, in, in a theory of gravity, I don't have any well-defined optional observables. Uh, maybe that should be the, the, uh, the definition of quantum gravity versus non-quantum gravity. But in this theory, it's not clear to me that there are no optional observables. So Cardi wrote down some, some nice flow equations for correlation functions in TT bar. Uh, I'll present to you some Virasoro symmetries, which are sort of bulk integrals. Uh, so my own inclination would be to say that this is more like a non-local QFT or maybe a CFT. Yeah, but induced two-dimensional gravity or polar code, you know, square root of GR all times one over Laplacian square root of GR is not local in metric. But if you write then as, as Polyakov did uh, uh, many years ago, there is this uh, Polyakov's two-dimensional gravity, which is awful Lagrangian, it's horrible, but it's still there. And the, uh, the field there is a diffeomorphism of the circle extended to the disk. So if you think about uh, dynamical variables there is a, is a defest one, which is very important now for many models like SYK and so on and which is also holographic, as you know, from SYK and so I think that this is that two-dimensional gravity code. Maybe, yeah, so, so I, um, these comments are mainly referring to some comments in Dubovsky's paper about the absence of offshore observables. I'm, I'm not sure this theory really- Did they explain what two-dimensional gravity is? It? Well, they had some long discussion uh, about uh, what do you mean and how it's not very well defined. <laughs> So it's not clear, basically. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the things that people really like to compute in these theories uh, is the energy spectrum in, in finite size, and uh, which, which comes from understanding how, how, how these uh, energy levels. Okay, uh, maybe I can say it better. So, 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 so one nice observable is the finite size uh, energy spectrum. And to get that, you put the, this, this theory, the TT bar deformed or any Smirnov's analogy of deformed uh, theory on a cylinder. 
And, and basically what happens is that the Hilbert space is unchanged. The, the only thing that changes is the Hamiltonian and, and its eigenvalues and eigenstates. So then you, 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 you can just write down some equations for the flow energies, uh, which is just first order quantum mechanics perturbation theory like this. And then uh, you can basically massage. So, so here it's the perturbing operator, the Smirnov's analogic of operator. Uh, and then it can be shown that it can be massaged in, in this nice form. So there's the anti-symmetrized combination of the zero modes on the cylinder of, of the two currents, plus something that's uh, commutator with the Hamilton. So you need to see that this term doesn't contribute to the flow of the energy, and, and this term actually can be written in terms of some nice derivatives with respect to the potential, which in the end of the day will, is going to give you a universal deformed energy spectrum. So it's going to give you some universal flow of the energy levels that only depends on the initial condition. So, 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 so you get a universal deformed energy spectrum, which, for example, for TT bar and the CFT looks like this. That's, that's the initial energy. And the deformed energy is just given by the symbol squared for that. Um, then you can do very nice thermodynamics with it because this is an integrable flow. The number of states doesn't change. So the entropy is the same as the initial entropy, except that now you have to re-express the initial energy in terms of the actual energy. And, and then you, for TT bar, for example, you get something like this, if you had Cardi initially. Uh, and you see that this is a Hagedon behavior at high energy. And this maps nicely back to, 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 to this connection to the bosonic string. And you get very, very similar results for all smirnov zamenhof deformations for TT bar and also for, arbitrary complicated uh, combinations of TT bar and various JTA. And I think uh, Sergei Frolov has a nice, uh, you know, complete formula of, uh, of, of the spectra that you get. Uh, for JT bar, you, JT bar works very much uh, the same. So, so JT bar, you take a U1 current and this T bar. And uh, OK, now the, the formation is going to be called lambda. It has dimensions of length, and it's actually a vector because the operator breaks Lorentz invariance. And what's nice about this deformation is that because the deforming operator is 1,2, as you can see from here, um, this deformation preserves the left. If you start with the CFT, it preserves the left conformal invariance, but breaks the right moving one. And actually, it makes the theory non-local on the right moving side because this is where the irrelevant operator is. However, on the left, the theory stays lo local and conformal and has the structure of a one-dimensional C. So, so this is what basically makes JT bar way simpler to study than TT bar for a lot of questions. Uh, and then, okay, you can study finite side spectrum and whatnot. Uh, and now the issue of offshore observables is very simple. You very clearly have operators with well-defined correlation functions. They're actually CFT1 correlators, and you can compute the deformed conformal dimensions in terms of the undeformed one. And they look like, uh, like they've been spectrally flowed by an amount proportional to the right moving moment. So they become momentum dependent, and that's precisely a consequence of the fact that uh, you, you've done an irrelevant deformation and the theory becomes non. -like. So you break the two dimensional Lorentz in R. Yeah, that's, that's, that's broken, but I'm, I'm preserving this. So this is very important. I'm, I'm preserving uh, the left conformal invariance, which is going to give me a lot of uh, control over the theory. And the other side becomes completely non-local. And, uh, and that's interesting to start. OK, so, so if you're to remember anything from here, is is this symmetry structure, which is very important. Uh, sometimes I call it a dipole CFT structure. It's a structure that appears generically in, in the um, you know, microscopic duals to extreme black holes have precisely this structure. So, so this is why it's interesting. And uh, OK, this will be used later. <clears throat> OK, so th that was the review. Uh, so now let me talk about these this symmetries and why you should think about this as no Um so, so I start with an abstract proof of this zero sort of symmetry. So, so I told you I, I, I'm putting my, my theory, any of these minerals of multiple deformed theories on the cylinder. And I look at the flow of the states. And uh, you know, almost by definition, uh, this, uh, okay, this is this is going to flow like this with with mu, with some operator chi, which is well defined. So chi will depend on on the particular deformation, but otherwise it's a fully quantum me mechanically well defined operator. And uh, once I have chi, I can just define some Virasoro generators, some some operators, 
via this flow integration. So, so I'll say they, they flow in the same way as the energy eigenstates with the initial condition that they equal the original CFT Hira Soro generators at mu equal to zero. Okay, so, and let's say for all the symmetry generators, so for the L bars and also for, for the cuts and so, so clearly this is a, a well-defined unambiguous definition of this L tildes. And, and the resulting generators are gonna by construction satisfy a Virasor algebra. So, so that just follows, uh, you just need this chi to satisfy the Jacobi identity with respect to the LNs and it just follows. And the central extension will be identical to that of the undeformed CFT because you're just flowing. So, 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 so this follows by definition. Uh, another thing that follows by definition is that the eigenvalues of this L0 tilde are gonna be identical to the eigenvalues of L0 in the original CFT. That's just implied by the flow equation. Okay, because uh, this sorry, guy- Monica, one question. So yeah. are, are there operators that commute with the chi? So is there some, some kernel there in this equation or not? Uh, no, in principle, these guys don't commute with chi. So, so it's, 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 yeah, you're just trying to transport the, the original Virasoro generators in the deform theory in some particular way, in a, in, in, a, in a way that the algebra is preserved and so on. So you just conjugate them by the same unitary that, that's, that's conjugating the state, that's multiplying the state. That's, that's basically what you're doing. I, I'm, I, don't, I don't think there's a, I haven't thought about it, but a priori I don't see that. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so they satisfy Viera Sora and they have the same eigenvalues as the original uh, CFT conformal dimensions. However, please note that the fact that these guys satisfy Vira Soro algebra doesn't mean that the theory has Vira Soro symmetries. You, you can come up with zillions of operators that satisfy Vira Soro algebra. Like uh, the original CFT generator still satisfy Vira Soro algebra, but okay. Any two dimensional sigma model, you can construct Vira Soro algebra, but it will have nothing to do with Hamiltonian. Very good. The symmetry is when Hamiltonian is, is a square of Vira Soro plus anti whatever. I mean, Torian has to be Well, I, I, I'm going to say that it can be a bit more general than that. Okay, so, so in order to have a Virasoro symmetry, we need, to, we need this, uh, these uh, operators to be conserved. And by that, I mean, uh, the, the conservation condition is not just that they commute to the Hamiltonian. That's not true if we even usual Virasoro. Um, the, the conservation condition is that you, you should be able to add some time dependence to them such that this equation is true. This equation is basically telling you that the corresponding Heisenberg picture operator is time independent. Okay, so 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 this is obeyed by usual Virasoro, where you have some time dependence because there are space. Wait, okay. you want to you, you want to conserve Virasoro times Virasoro, not just Vera. You have left. Oh Verasoro. yeah, uh, this uh, this holds for all of them at the same time. I'm just doing one because uh, otherwise I write too much. So this only left to moving Hamilton. Exactly. Okay. Uh, H is the full Hamilton. Full, then it has to be sum of left moving and right moving, or there will be no factorization. Sorry. So if we have Verasora holomorphic, Verasora anti holomorphic preserved, right? I'm looking and at the flowed left moving generators, this L tilde. Only left moving, yeah. And H is the full Hamilton. Okay. It's, uh, it cannot be written as H left plus H right. Wait, it's just oh, wait, it can. Sorry, sorry, I'm being stupid. Of course, it can be. Of course, of course. <laughs> of course. But uh, but uh, but uh, okay, the commutators are, are, are different. Uh, this is the full Hamilton. Okay. Well, it is, it's just unitary evolution, right? That's all you're uh, demanding. Um, no, I, I'm I'm demanding that the Heisenberg picture operator be time independent. That, that, and that's the condition. Oh. I I want to conserve but charge. Okay. All right. I want to conserve charge. So if the Heisenberg picture operator is time independent, then its expectation value in, in any state is, is gonna be time independent. So, so I get the conserved point. And, and this is the condition. Okay, so, so in order to compute this, I need the commutator of this tilde with H. And basically this is fixed by the relation between the Hamiltonian and this L0 tilde. 
And this relation follows from the fact that the TT bar different spectrum is, is universal as pointed out by these people. So, so basically, be, before I showed you some formula that told me about the TT bar deformed energies as a function of the undeformed energy, which is H tilde plus H bar tilde, basically, this uh, in terms of the original conformal dimension um, and the momentum, which is this guy. And now what I'm saying is, is, is the following. Notice that this E is nothing but the eigenvalue of H. Whereas, as I just told you, H tilde is nothing but the eigenvalue of L0 tilde, and similarly for H bar tilde. And because this is a completely universal formula that holds for all energy eigenstates in any CFT, I can just uplift it to a relationship between the, uh, between the operators themselves. So I replace this by the Hamiltonian operator and this by L0 tilde. Okay, so uh, I can also invert this relation to write it more nicely. So, so this gives me this particular quadratic relation between L0 tilde in terms of the Hamiltonian is just a function of the Hamiltonian and the momentum operator. And same for L0 bar tilde. Okay, so, so this I've extracted. And, 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 and given this universal formula between L0 and H, I can just compute this commutator very easily because I know the commutator with L0 tilde. And, and, and I can just derive this commutator. And very importantly, it ends up being proportional with L tilde mu. And this would not be true uh, of a randomly picked uh, set of operators that satisfy the Dirasol algebra. Okay, and this alpha m that sits in front is some operator valued uh, uh, function that depends on h and p and Planck's constant and that. So, so, so basically, okay, very good. So, so, so this is what I get. And now it's very easy to, to put in a time dependence such that the, 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 the Schrodinger picture and the, and the, the operator is conserved. I, I, I just put, the, I, I just exponentiate this. And uh, these operators do satisfy this relation. Therefore, these LMs correspond to conserved quantities, and therefore I have the sort of symmetries. And, and note that the only difference between this and standard CFT, in standard CFT, I also have to add in by hand the time dependence because. Uh, um, LM with H is, is, is not zero. Uh, the only difference is that in that case, H is L0 plus L0 bar, whereas here there is a more complicated relation between the two, but, but, but that's the only difference. Okay. Uh, okay, and uh, this is TT bar. Uh, for JT bar, you can do the same thing. On the local side, you, you get an alpha M, which is just a number. On the local side, you, you get it again, uh, operator dependent. Uh, okay, so so what is clear? This is a sort of I, I went through it slowly because I, I thought it's a sort of short enough to do people have questions. So this is the proof of the Rasoro symmetry in this theory. It follows from this flow equation plus the fact this non-trivial fact this L0 tilde is a very simple function of a Hamiltonian and non Hamiltonian. Okay, now, now I can ask how, so, so this, I, I gave you some abstract way to construct the symmetries, how they realized classically. Uh, so it turns out that classical TT bar and JT bar different CFTs have indeed an infinite number of symmetries. Uh, so the conserved charges are something like this. They're the left moving Hamiltonian into some arbitrary function of some field dependent coordinate. So, so they're really field dependent coordinate transformations. You also have the right moving ones and also some affine new ones in JT bar. And, and you have, a, so, so these QFs are symmetries, meaning that they satisfy this, this relation, which is the classical counterpart of the quantum relation we just discussed for any function f of u, provided that u satisfies some relation. And that relation is universal for each deformation in part. So, so, for example, in TT bar, you can solve the, the equation that you get for you, and you find that it's, uh, you know, the left moving coordinate plus the integral of the right moving Hamiltonian current up to sigma. Sorry, this is not over the entire set. Uh, and same for V. In JT bar, the relations are simpler. U is a, a field independent coordinate, actually, and V, uh, it's, uh, it just uh, has a shift by a boson, which is the bosonization of the ion. Okay, so uh, so okay, so one can check that these are symmetries classically, and very roughly speaking, you can think of this as the original CFT symmetry seen through the prism of the dynamical coordinates I talked about. Uh, 
this is roughly what they are. But to be rigorous, you well, this map is not very useful actually to, for being rigorous. Um, now it seems that this variable v actually is a target space coordinate because this phi, which is a bosonization of j, can be viewed as some object in space time. And that object now gets, so you have like. I, I don't know what's the. Um... I don't know exactly for JT bar whether there's some nice interpretation on a. I mean, watch in target space the duality, right? You have, but on, only on one side, which is uh, which is mm. V. Yeah, so. for JT bar there might be one, but I yeah I I, I uh, yeah I don't know. Uh, but yeah, okay, I I haven't thought about it. Uh, but there's a one really important point here is that when you put this discharges in compact space, you have to be super ultra careful about zero modes. So, so the, the zero modes of the field dependent coordinates can, can, can actually completely destroy your, uh, they can make your Poisson brackets inconsistent <laughs> with charge, charge and momentum quantization. So you really have to remove them and removing them uh, while preserving the conservation equation is non-trivial, but you can do it. Uh, but while you do it, you have to recompute the charge algebra because it's, uh, yeah, they, they, they have very non trivial contributions. Anyways, so you just remove the zero mode and then everything looks consistent with everything, like um, semi classical quantization and so on. And then uh, you can ask, uh, okay, what do these generators of the symmetries on the cylinder have to do with the, the, the classical limit of the generators I just talked about over here, these guys? How, how are they related? Well, these guys were defined via the flow equation, and you know we know the classical counterpart of this guy, so we can compute it and find the relationship between the flowed charges in the classical limit and these uh, pseudo-conformal generators. And the relation is, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's not super ugly, but it's not super simple either. It, it looks like some spectral flow by the right moving energy, right moving Hamiltonian, roughly speaking. Uh, so, so this uh, this this is uh, true in JT bar. For for JT bar, uh, we're <laughs> we're uh, we're working on uh, on it. So, so for JT bar, we have the charges, but uh, but we we don't yet have the the relationship between the flow generators and the pseudo conformal ones, but probably. Okay, good. I'm I'm running a bit out of time, so let me just uh, try to tell you. Uh, uh, how one may try to compute correlation functions in, in, in this theory. And, and the, basically the main idea is to use the interplay between these two sets of, um, like these two bases for the symmetry algebra, the flow of the generators and the pseudo conformal ones. Uh, so, so now uh, I'm thinking these relations on the previous page, which were classical relations. And I'm assuming that they hold fully quantum mechanically. I cannot check that because I only have a quantum mechanical definition of this L tildes. So I'll just assume that these things hold, but I, I, there could in principle be quantum corrections to, to this relation. Uh, so now uh, the, the algebra of these LNs and JNs, the, the left moving guys, is just Virasoro Katsumuni. So, so the algebra of these guys is always Virasoro, Virasoro Katsumuni by the flow equation. The algebra of these guys is, uh, is Virasoro Katsumuni also. But the algebra of the right movers, uh, because of the spectral flow, is very complicated. Some nonlinear deformation thereof, some, some disgusting. So, so now what we want to do is, is to define some sort of primary operators with respect to the sort of physical operators that implement conformal and pseudo-conformal transformations, which are the L's without the tilts. So, so, so it's clear on the left moving side, because the left moving side is local. Uh, this is uh, this is simple. So we just impose the primary condition with respect to the LN, and we know how what that the dimensions uh, shift in this momentum dependent way. So so that's fine. Um, whereas on the right moving side, well uh, things get a lot more complicated uh, because uh, well first of all we have to uh, work in uh, momentum space because of this momentum dependence. And we don't really know what primary conditions to, to impose because on the right moving side, uh, we, we don't have Virasoro, we have some crap. Okay, so, so what we're gonna do on the left moving side, so, so we're, we're basically gonna solve for this O in terms of some auxiliary operator O tilde, which is simply to define, define the flow in the same way as the state. 
So, so this is just some unphysical operator with two labels, W and W bar, which are the labels of the undeformed operator that we're flowing. And uh, the advantage of, of, of this O-tilde is that it has identical correlation functions and word identities with respect to the flow generators as the operators in the undeformed system. This is completely fair. This is completely auxiliary. We just conjugated everything by, by the unitary flow. That's all we do. Um, and, and basically what we want to do, we want to express the physical primary operator in terms of this O-tilde. So on the left moving side, that's very simple because we know that the physical primary operator is primary with respect to this guy, whereas O-tilde is primary sort of with respect to this L-tilde with conformal dimension H-tilde. And from that, we can just deduce that the two differ by an exponential factor like this and like that. This we derive. This, this will produce the, the shift in the conformal dimension. Uh, and on the right moving side, as I said here, we don't really know what to do. So we just make a wild guess, which is basically to write down the same expression as we had on the left, but in terms of W. This is a wild guess. Uh, so now we can take our guess. And first of all, compute the word identities. So on the left, by construction, there are CFT word identities. On the right, with respect to the L bars, they look a bit ugly. However, when you take the decompactification limit, so you send the cylinder radius to infinity, they look pretty just like a CFT word identities. So, so, so maybe our guest operator is, is nice because it has CFT like word identities. And, and these are the associated conformal dimensions of the shift. So, so this was an input, but this is sort of an output of our guess on the right moving side. Uh, another thing we can do, so, so, so taking this expression, so it should be clear that one can compute arbitrary correlation functions of, of these operators in the flow of the vacuum. Why? Because when you take expectation values, I mean, these j's, you know how to commute them through and you just pick some factors. Yeah, you just use BCH formula and whatnot. And then you're left with the correlation function of the O tildes in the flow of the vacuum, but that's identical to the original CFT correlator. You can just express all correlation functions of these O's in terms of original CFT correlators. And for example, if you're just looking at two and three point functions, the, the result is at, at infinite radius is very simple. The result looks like the uh, original CFT momentum space correlator, but with all conformal dimensions replaced by this momentum dependent conformal dimensions. Okay, so, so this was a guess for what the primary condition should be. But okay, th there's some condition that one can write down and actually compute uh, all possible correlation functions from it and give some result that looks a lot like, like what one sees in black box. Um, I had a couple of slides of lessons on holography, but, uh, but I can skip them if there's no time. We started a little bit late, so yeah, five, on five to 10 more minutes if you want. Okay, I'll just say a couple of words. So, so, but okay. So, so, so basically, the, the main part of the talk was was this that that we have these symmetries, and we can also, in principle, define some notion of primaries with correlation functions we can compute. These are some sort of side remarks on, you know, since my motivation was holography, what can one hope to learn from this? And <clears throat> I think one, one nice thing that one can learn from this uh, is uh, is is uh, the following. So, so this TT bar and JT bar actually, uh, they're not directly relevant for non-ADS holography because they're double trace deformations. So as you probably well know, um, double trace deformations just change the boundary conditions for the dual bulk field. So in this case, it's the dual metric. And okay, one can write down some holographic dictionary and uh, okay, it perfectly matches you know, spectrum and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think one nice thing about this holographic addition is that it's a top-down construction. So in a sense that you know exactly what the boundary theory is, is this TT bar or JT bar, and you're deriving the properties of the bulk gravity theory. Um, this is different from what people usually do when imposing you know, alternate boundary conditions for the ADS3 metric, because usually they start from the bulk, they impose some consistent looking boundary conditions, and then they try to infer the properties of the boundary theory. This is what I was doing at the beginning of the talk when I talked about this here. So, so you know, you're just guessing what the rules of the game are. Um, 
However, not uh, so. So, so remember that I, 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 when I talked about this field dependent symmetries and so on, at some point I, I said it was really important to kick out the zero mode because it's causing a lot of uh, inconsistencies. So you have to remove it, and field theory is telling you you have to remove it. Procedure of removing the zero mode looks extremely unnatural from the bulk point of view. I've never seen anybody do an asymptotic symmetry group where they kick out the zero mode. So, so it might be that by you know, you know, understanding the symmetries in the boundary and using the fact that this is a top-down holographic dictionary for mixed boundary conditions and ideas, we, we might learn of some new rules you know, for how to do asymptotic symmetric group analysis, which would be quite interesting because these are basically some of the main tools that people use to investigate holography for space and that are not ideas, such as flat space or, or, or stuff like that. So, 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 so I think this, this, this could be some, some potentially interesting application to, to holography of, of these tools. Uh, the other comment that I wanted to make is that, uh, okay, so, so I said I'm interested in non-ADS holography. TT bar is not dual to non-ADS, but one can do a modification of TT bar to get to a non-ADS background, which is uh, this so-called single trace TT bar deformation. So this is done in some specific setting in string theory where one looks at the near horizon of the NS5 F1 system, which is dual to some, at least part of it is described by a symmetric product or before here. And the idea is that uh, if you take the symmetric product or before theory due to ADS3, add to it the single trace TT bar deformation, which where the sum is the sum over copies, uh, then the gravity dual background is uh, the is basically the, the near horizon of the NS5 brain, so that's uh, asymptotically flat with a linear dilaton. And, and the theory should should describe some sort of compartification of two, uh, two, two dimensions of little string theory. So, so, so this is very interesting because, I mean, if you understand TT bar, symmetric product or default of TT bar is not that hard to understand. And you know, and this this gives a completely concrete holographic, uh, you know, um, proposal for you know some some particularly particular interesting non ADS background. So so it would be you know the fact that it's so concrete, it, you know, it, it calls for, for for being understood. And same goes for JT bar, which is basically the first con uh, concrete microscopic uh, proposal for an extremely black hole. So so uh, it would be very interesting to try to better uh, and. I mean, from work in progress, we, we, we know that these Vera Soros symmetries actually do extend to uh, when, when you do the symmetric product or before the TT bar different theories, which is what you're doing over here. And uh, it, uh, it would be very interesting to understand whether if you start now deforming the theory. So, so as Samson was saying, you have a conformal manifold. Now you're going off by doing this 2,2 .2 deformation, but you might still be having some sort of conformal manifold over here. When you start going off in that, do the Vera Soros symmetry survive? You know, how do you describe the, the, the theories in the group and so on? What are the generalizations of this setup of the symmetric product of the four points? That, that, that would be very interesting. Okay, so let me just keep the conclusion since I'm over time. Uh, and, and thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. That's a thanker for the nice talk. Okay, thank you very much. We uh, we had a lot of questions already, but we have time for uh, for a few more if there are. Any other questions? Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so if we talk about um, um, uh, stress energy tensor and uh, the uh, Katsmudi current, uh, in mm -hmm. theory, uh, are those operators primary operators according to your classification? That's uh, that's a good question. So, uh, so because the, these were initially holomorphic, uh, so 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 the, so the construction in uh, my last paper specifically referred to operators that had non-trivial p and t bar. Whereas uh, something that was initially holomorphic, it, it has a uh, p bar equal to zero. It, it has, 
Um, yeah, so, so um, the, the, the answer is, I don't know, because uh, the, the, the general analysis does, doesn't quite apply to, to, to conserve currents, and I haven't looked into it. So but, you, don't, you don't know how to compute uh, two and three point correlation functions of uh, the stress energy tensor and the... I think in principle it's doable. I, I, I just uh, didn't, uh, you know, look into it carefully. But it might be that it's uh, it, there are some additional subtleties having to do with this thing, uh, with the fact that these guys were initially holomorphically conserved. If you do conformal perturbation theory and you look at T bar, for example, it does look like its dimension is shifted like the dimension of all the other operators, like, uh, like this. No, no, I'm not talking T about T bar, no, just, just stress energy bands T menu, this T menu. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so in JT bar. So in principle, it should be sufficient because the trace of the stress energy tensor is proportional to the TT bar. Right? Yeah, so, so sorry. So here I wasn't doing TT bar because I don't yet know how to do TT bar. I was doing JT bar. Right. For, for TJ uh, uh, operator, I, I suppose uh, the situation should be simpler, but, but still, that's how. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but you can do conformal perturbation theory. And, yeah, and, and it's as, that perturbatively yeah. in, in the deformation parameter, you can compute everything. It's, it's not really a problem. I'm talking about uh, finite mu. And I guess you can see the only finite well, 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 but, but uh, for example, you can see the anomalous dimension already from a perturbative uh, calculation. And, and I'm oh, saying yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not the exact one, I guess. Well, it turns out to be exact to second order in this case. Actually, now I'm confused. You used mu. Ah, way. sorry. Uh, JT bar has lambda and TT bar has mu. Ah, okay. <laughs> sorry, I forgot to say it. Okay. But 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 what I wanted to say is so 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 T bar is an operator in 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 the theory, and you can ask if it gets an anomalous dimension, and the answer is yes, it gets this anomalous dimension because its original left it's dimension was zero, how, and it's how do, how do you prove that it's uh, um, finite expansion, just a quadratic polynomial in lambda? Um, so, so, so the, this um, uh, this formula can be obtained by boosting the uh, energy formula of of, of uh, different energies on the cylinder. So, so, so you have a yeah. square root formula for for the deformed energies on the cylinder, and then you can tie, take an infinite boost limit of that to try to read off left conformal dimensions of it, and gives you this formula, which is exact to second order in lambda. And then you, you can do conform a perturbation theory up to second order and see that you agree with it. I haven't done over second order because uh, it gets complicated. And, and this thing with the primary operators, uh, so, so in, indeed, this is a good question. I, 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 one would need to be a bit more careful with the currents and I haven't looked into it yet. I think it's doable, but, but one could ask, okay, what happens to, to, to this holomorphic, initially holomorphic primary operators? Um, Maybe they, they might get shifted around a bit. I, I, I don't know, but in principle, it's doable via the same technique, I think. Uh, you don't expect some other operators to be generated once you yeah. include this one? Uh, could there appear some other operators? The relevant uh, operators? So you, you mean whether there is mixing? Yeah, maybe some kind of mixing. Yeah. I mean, the mixing um, occurs because the, the deformation is sort of uh, universal just by um, conserved currents, the mixing only occurs inside the conformal family. Yeah, but why, why, well, okay, yeah, you probably, in this case, probably you would not have mixing. You don't have but, 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 but the, yeah, so, so I guess the statement is simply that there is some So basically, basically my, my question is, you, uh, you have JT bar deform uh, operator. Uh, I, I'm sure you would not also generate TT bar uh, flow. Uh, well, in the middle of the logic of construction, it wasn't uh, generated. Then you, you can try to start with the two deformations and then, okay, depending on the parameters and so on, you have to be a bit more careful because some others can be generated. But JT bar by itself doesn't generate anything else, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Neither does TT bar. When you put several of them together, then you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. But, but yeah, it's a good question. I, I, it's, it's not done yet. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Okay, if not, then we have- Maybe, maybe I can ask one more general question. Yes, Just go ahead. In, uh, in critical phenomenon, renormalization group theory, the effective action of a conformal theory is usually considered to be non-local. I mean, is this the same non-locality that happens there? For instance, we often start with a field theory in three dimensions, five, four theory with a, with a dimensionful scale, but in the infrared limit, uh, and it, the, the scale invariant conformal theory is, is really a non-local theory. Is this the same spirit that you're uh, you're hoping to get? Uh, sorry, I, I don't really I, I don't really understand the, the the question. So so if I I mean just in not 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 directly related to the talk, but when I was talking about this, for example, decoupling limits in string theory that might give theories of this kind. In the decoupling limit, what one does, so one takes a, a low energy limit, which would normally give a scale invariant theory. But at the same time, sends pa some parameter to infinity, some Lorentz breaking parameter to infinity, like for example, the D field in, in string theory. Yeah, but in, in some sense, uh, the string theory is an uninteracting theory at, at an elementary level. Uh, whereas in an interacting theory, if I want it to be conformal and variant in the ultraviolet, it has to be non local. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> An untrivial theory. I, I don't know. Okay. Sorry. To go. Monica, nice to see you. Very nice to see you too, Samson. Bye, bye, bye. 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 So if there are no further questions, let's uh, thank Monica again for the nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Maybe we'll see you in person again. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.